A few months ago, I attended a benefit dinner for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which is an organization that grants the wishes of children with life-threatening illnesses. And during the evening, we saw a film that was so heartwarming, scene after scene of these children registering joy and exhilaration on their faces as their lifelong dreams came true before their eyes. And I must admit that a cynical thought crossed my mind. With the vast sums of money being spent on these one-off explosions of positive emotion, perhaps excessive, was fulfilling these fantasies of these ill children even good for them? After all, upon receiving the thing they had wanted most in life, might their lives from this point onward not be one big letdown and anticlimax. Indeed, was it even good for these children that this organization somehow skewed their sense of reality, exaggerating the realm of possibility and potentially planting seeds a false hope and expectation in these already fragile hearts and minds. The keynote speaker was a renowned professor on happiness named Tal Ben Shachar. And in his address, he touched on these very concerns and he explained that some of his colleagues and he had gathered 60 children with life-threatening diseases, 30 of which they put in a control group, and the other 30, they granted their wishes. And the results were astounding. Every single one of those 30 gratified participants had undergone a dramatic and remarkable physical and psychological improvement, many of them overcoming their illnesses. And he explained the science behind this. He says, we believe it's down to the fact that those 30 gratified participants had exercised a muscle that they had never exercised prior, the muscle of impossibility. You see, in life, we tend to separate our dreams and desires into two categories. One, those we deem possible. The other, those we deem impossible. And as life goes on, the line between those two categories becomes reinforced and entrenched. And so imagine the dramatic shift that goes on in the mind of a child when suddenly one morning Michael Jordan shows up at his doorstep. Suddenly something that had previously been deemed impossible has been proven possible. And then this child thinks to himself, well, why can't I apply that to my medical condition? And it is this paradigm shift where the lines blur that helps fuel the faith and fortitude and eventually the healing of these children. And when I heard this idea, it struck me that of all the people to walk the face of this planet, the Jewish people more than any other has exercised the muscle of impossibility. As so many eloquent historians have articulated, in one way or another, Jewish existence and survival is nothing short of miraculous. Be it Mark Twain who called us immortal, Tolstoy who called us eternal, Pascal invincible, one thing they can all agree on, and that is that the normal parameters of historical possibility, as they exist and pertain to any other nation on earth, simply do not exist when it comes to the Jewish people. Please join me on the following thought exercise. Let me invite you to a roundtable discussion by the sages of Israel as they determine which passage of the Torah will be selected to be read on the most consequential day of the Jewish calendar, Rosh Hashanah. The moderator goes around the table and suddenly it's your turn. There you are. What do you choose? I'd understand if you would choose the account of creation of mankind. After all, Rosh Hashanah marks the birthday of humanity. I'd understand if you chose the great exodus, which tells the story of our national birth, or the revelation at Sinai, which talks about our spiritual birth. And yet the rabbis, in their infinite wisdom, seem to have chosen a passage that tells an irrelevant and dated story of an old woman who lived a childless life for much of her life and then had a baby at age 90. And for the second day's reading... They chose the terrifying story of how that little baby, born to that old woman, nearly lost his life atop an altar. Am I missing something? And I've come to appreciate that this narrative, ironically, gains relevance in time because that little baby was the first child to be born Jewish and thus comes to represent the genesis and the survival of the Jewish people and its history in its entirety. We can just imagine Sarah sitting in the hospital ward, nervously wringing her hands, 
when the fertility experts come in and they say with somber faces, Sarah, we regret to inform you that you will never have a child. Take the dream of bringing life out of the basket of possibility and place it into the dustbin of impossibility. But then, like the unexpected punchline of a joke, Yitzchak is born within a year and he is appropriately named Laughter in a nod both to his birth and to the future existence of his progeny. And on the second day, we read the story that teaches us that should that people be figuratively bound to an altar with a blade pressing against their neck, they must never despair because salvation can come in the blink of an eye. And it is this message that nothing is impossible that was embossed on the currency of the coinage used by some of our greatest ancestors. The Talmud teaches that Avram minted his own coin on the one side, an old woman and man on the other, youth and a maiden, to represent the miraculous birth of his son Yitzchak. King David had his own coins on one side, the image of a satchel and shepherd's staff on the other, of a throne, representing his personal life transformation, being elevated from an excommunicated, despised shepherd boy to become the great king of Israel about whom we sing till this very day, David Melech Yisrael Chai Vikayam. Fast forward and we come to Mordechai on the coins that he had one side featured ash and sackcloth, symbols of mourning. On the other, a golden crown representing the complete and utter transformation represented by the story of Purim, Vina Hapechu. A fascinating historical note about the Baal Shem Tov. He would sign his name Yisrael, not from Tlust, which is the town in Galicia where he was born, but rather Yisrael from Okap, which is Russian for the trenches, after the life circumstances into which he was born. Because Tlust at one point had been a walled city, but those walls were destroyed and in their place, trenches were left behind and the family of the Baal Shem Tov was so poor they couldn't even afford a modest home and so he was born and raised in those trenches and it was this child born impoverished and orphaned that would come to light the collective soul and imagination of the Jewish people on fire with ideas that reverberate till this very day and are said to affect the coming of Mashiach. And so, my friends, when life seems to be overwhelming and the realm of the impossible seems to close in, when you look at a dysfunctional relationship and tell yourself, this relationship will never heal, or you identify a character flaw, or an addiction, and you say, I will never overcome this, I want you to remember the story of that little child who was never meant to be, let alone survive. And I want you to remember that that child is you. And when you get a sense that Israel hatred or anti-Semitism is the new normal, I want you to remember that Jewish people are not the joke of history. We are its punchline. And when we look around the world and we see a turbulent reality, we might be tempted to think cynically that the only way that the precarious ship of history we currently inhabit can be righted is through a miracle. I want you to remember those powerful words attributed to Ben-Gurion who said that a Jew who does not believe in miracles, is not a realist. Thank you.